Good morning and welcome to Queensway Connect. This is the online recorded service for Queensway Chapel here in Melcham in Wiltshire. Uh, we really appreciate that some of you who are unable to get to church because of ill health or because of ongoing fears or concerns over COVID-19 or because you live far away from Melchim but you appreciate uh, the offering that we bring you Sunday by Sunday that uh, you are tuning in and we thank you for your comments whether it's on Facebook or on YouTube. Over the coming weeks we will move from posting the uh, premiered video on Facebook and YouTube simultaneously to posting a link on Facebook to the YouTube video. So you will notice a difference that we will post a link. If you follow us on Facebook, you'll be able to click on the link and it will take you to the YouTube video, which will run every week at half past 10 as usual. So hopefully no change in transmission. It'll just take you straight to the YouTube page, which seems to provide us with a better service um, as some of you have noticed some problems on the Facebook transmission. We apologize for that. Unfortunately, that's been out of our control. Well, let's get on with things. Last week, we said goodbye to David and Jill Auger. We did that here online, but we also did it in the chapel physically. And next Sunday, we're moving to a new format in our physical service at the chapel. So today, both at the chapel and here online, is just a moment for pause, for thought and reflection and to renew our commitment to one another and, of course, to Christ. So I hope that you'll enjoy the uh, songs and the testimony. Some of them you will have seen before. And this morning I'm going to be preaching. It was a preach that uh, I prepared some time ago and we felt it was a, an appropriate uh, message to share with you here on Queensway Connect based on Acts chapter 15. So sorry for the elongated introduction, but I wanted to give you a little update on some of the changes that will be taking place. And I'll chat to you a little later on. God bless you. Enjoy the worship that we share together. We pray, unveil while we're made 
Morning everyone. Please indulge me. It's very rare to get the opportunity to speak on my favourite subject, the apple of my eye, without fear of heckling or yawning. So please bear with me. But if you feel like doing either, it doesn't matter, I wouldn't know anyway. Now, most of you will know that about four, four years or so ago, my life changed radically when I welcomed a Border Collie puppy into my life. And the spiritual parallels between our relationship and the Christian walk with the Lord continue to amaze me. And I'd like to share some of them with you. I'm entitling this message, Note to Self, Be More God Free. I chose him at eight weeks old and I gave him a name. Not one necessarily that suited him at the time, but one that he would grow into once he started to fulfill the plan I, as his master, had for his life. His name, Godfrey, means the peace of God, although certainly at that stage he appeared to be working for the other side. He was feisty, hyper, willful, but super bright. I still bear the scars to prove it, but with love, patience, positive training methods and gentle encouraging discipline, we formed an unbreakable bond. I would do anything for him, and he just loves to please me. I am his master, and he is my child, albeit a furry one. And I'm incredibly proud of him as he, for the last two years, has fulfilled his role as a qualified therapy dog, ministering with bundles of love to special needs children, young carers, the elderly and stressed adults at ambulance stations and 999 call centres, among others. He thoroughly enjoys his work. The work has been given total, that he's been given totally fits his character and temperament. He knows and hears my voice. He likes nothing better than to spend time with me at work, play, or just lying at my feet. He trusts me totally to supply his every need. Make no mistake, he, when he's not working, he's no angel. He can be clumsy, as mad as a box of frogs. And sometimes he'll look at me when I call him back at the park, as if to say, oh, talk to the poor as he follows a trail of fox, what's it, and comes back having rolled in something disgusting. But I love him and when he comes back filthy dirty and smelling not so nice, with his tail between his legs, I take him home willingly and wash him clean. Just as the Lord cleanses us once we repent, when we've strayed or got involved in something that we shouldn't. I tend his wounds when he's injured. He trusts me completely and without question. The other morning while at the park for our early walk, I spotted in the distance the embers of a deserted fire which burst back into flame dangerously near a crop of trees. Apart from us, the park was empty as we ran towards the ever-increasing fire which was gaining momentum. When we got to about 10 foot away, I got Godfrey, who was obviously faster than me, to do an emergency stop and lie down while I carried on and managed to kick apart the logs and extinguish the fire. Thank God for big welly boots. Now Godfrey has no concept of fire nor its potential for danger, but he just showed unflinching obedience because his master said so. And his master knows best, he can trust him. Godfrey has freedom to roam and do his own thing when we're out and when it's safe. But he also knows that the best sausages come from the hands of the master. And it's his master who's the one he can trust because he always has his best interests at heart. Please understand it's the relationship I'm comparing and I'm in no way comparing myself to God the Father. But the one thing I have learnt is that if this bond of love and complete trust can exist and flourish between one dumb animal and her dog. <laughs> How much more will your Father in Heaven give good things to those who ask Him? Thank you, Lord, for the precious, precious gift of free will. And thank you for the knowledge that there's no better place than walking by your side, hearing your voice and doing your will 
so that together we can fulfill your plan for our lives as partners in a winning team. Amen.
Hi, great to be with you. Just this week, I had a, an email from a friend. He's an elder of a church. I don't know him particularly well, but an elder of a church where he has written to say to me, there's a, there's a problem. And of course, problems do arise. They arise all the time. They arise in our personal relationships. Problems arise in our marriages. They arise in our families. We have issues and sometimes we need to deal with them. And of course, in this season of lockdown and starting to ease out of lockdown, there are all kinds of problems and questions that all of us are facing. There are issues with mental health and loneliness and isolation. There are um, marriage problems that are magnified through the unexpected closeness that's been forced on some couples who have managed to survive with social distance built into their marriage. And of course, the closeness that they have had to live in has identified, underlined some of the issues that maybe were buried or hidden. And those problems arise too in local churches. They arise in local churches. In the early church, there were a number of occurrences when problems arose. Now in Acts chapter 15, another issue has come to a head. This is an issue that's about the very heart of the Gospel. So I'm going to read to you from uh, the book of Acts, from chapter 15. I'm not going to read the whole chapter, it's quite a long chapter. And uh, I'm just going to read some sections to you. While Paul and Barnabas were at Antioch of Syria, some men from Judea arrived and began to teach the believers. Unless you are circumcised as required by the law of Moses, you cannot be saved. Paul and Barnabas disagreed with them, arguing vehemently. Finally, the church decided to send Paul and Barnabas to Jerusalem, accompanied by some believers, to talk to the apostles and elders about this question. The church sent the delegates to Jerusalem and they stopped along the way in Phoenicia and Samaria to visit the believers. They told them, much to everyone's joy, that the Gentiles too were being converted. When they arrived in Jerusalem, Barnabas and Paul were welcomed by the whole church, including the apostles and elders. They reported everything that God had done through them. But then some of the believers who belonged to the sect of the Pharisees stood up and insisted, The Gentile converts must be circumcised and required to follow the law of Moses. So the apostles and elders met together to resolve this issue. At the meeting, after a long discussion, Peter stood and addressed them as follows. After Peter gives an impassioned speech, James sums everything up. Verse 19. And so my judgment is that we should not make it difficult for the Gentiles who are turning to God. Instead, we should write and tell them to abstain from eating food offered to idols, from sexual immorality, from eating the meat of strangled animals, and from consuming blood. For these laws of Moses have been preached in Jewish synagogues in every city on every Sabbath for many generations. Then the apostles and elders, together with the whole church in Jerusalem, chose delegates, and they sent them to Antioch of Syria with Paul and Barnabas to report on this decision. The men chosen were two of the church leaders, Judas, also called Barsabbas, and Silas. This is the letter they took with them. This letter is from the apostles and elders, your brothers in Jerusalem. It is written to the Gentile believers in Antioch, Syria, and Cilicia. Greetings. We understand that some men from here have troubled you and upset you with their teaching, but we did not send them. So we decided, having come to complete agreement, to send you official representatives along with our beloved Barnabas and Paul, who have risked their lives for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. We are sending Judas and Silas to confirm what we have decided concerning your question. For it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us to lay no greater burden on you than these few requirements. You must abstain from eating food offered to idols, from consuming blood or the meat of strangled animals, and from sexual immorality. If you do this, you will do well. Farewell. 
The messengers went at once to Antioch, where they called a general meeting of the believers and delivered the letter. And there was great joy throughout the church that day as they read this encouraging message. Wow, it's an amazing reading, isn't it? And th there is a problem. And the problem that has arisen, the problem that they've discerned, the problem that they have discovered here in, the, uh, in chapter 15 in Acts is nothing less than a question about the gospel of Jesus itself. What does it take for a person to be saved? What is the entrance requirement to be in the family of God? Well, Jesus welcomed people who were already rejected by the religious system. And so Jesus is the saviour who welcomes outsiders. It's Luke who tells us the story of the prodigal son, about this younger son who goes away with the father's wealth, the father's prosperity, with his share of the inheritance, and he blows it, he prostitutes it. He sells himself to the lowest bidder and ultimately ends up in that outside place as far as the Jews are concerned on the pig farm feeding pigs. So I want you to get that. Jesus welcomes outsiders. And then Peter is in Joppa with Simon the Tanner. He's already on the fringes and the call comes from Cornelius, a Roman centurion, a Roman officer, come on over. God has given me a vision. And Peter has seen this vision three times, this um, sheet with food, this picnic blanket comes down from heaven with what Peter identifies as unclean food, at least in the minds of Jewish people. And now the Apostle Paul and uh, Barnabas, they've been seeing God's amazing blessings on their ministry. Um, Paul and Barnabas and in this mission that God has given them, they've been reaping, they've been traveling, they've been preaching the good news. And in place after place, the Jews, because they've first gone to the Jews, they've gone to the synagogue, uh, they've gone to where the Jewish people meet because the Old Testament scriptures, remember the only Bible they had was the Old Testament Bible. And from that, they preached Christ. They preached Jesus. They said, Jesus is the Messiah. He's the Savior. He's the one that we were expecting. He's the one that um, was promised to come to us. And so they preached Jesus. And most places... The synagogues, the Jewish people rejected them. They threw them out. Some places they beat them. Some places riots begun. And so Paul and his associates, Paul and his team, take the message to whoever. For God so loved the world, writes John in his gospel, that he gave his only son, that whoever, whosoever, believes in him. And Paul believed that message. And with his team, they took the message to whoever, not just to Jews, but to Gentiles. And the Apostle Paul is committed to the truth that Peter has discovered at the house of Cornelius. This message is for everyone. And the way that you come into the kingdom of God is through trusting in Christ, is through faith in Jesus. In the church up north, much further north than where Jesus was from, not in Nazareth, but um, in Antioch, of course there had been persecution in the book of Acts and the church is scattered and eventually because of persecution they follow the mission plan, the map that Jesus gave them in Acts chapter 1 uh, verse 8. Uh, start in Jerusalem, go to Judea, then Samaria, and you read how Philip takes the gospel to Samaria and then the ends of the earth. Well, Antioch is beyond Samaria and it's the beginning of the ends of the earth. It's, the, it's this wonderful place that God is blessing this ministry and people are being saved in Antioch and Paul and uh, his team go from Antioch and they take this gospel message. 
and false teachers, well not false teachers, but Pharisees have become Christians or Christians who are Pharisees. That is those who say you have to keep the Jewish law to be a follower of Jesus. You have to be circumcised. You have to abstain from unclean food. You have to keep the other Jewish laws and traditions. You know there were over 630 laws that were written that were supposed to be kept by the Jewish people. So this was the core of the argument. What does it take to be a Christian? It's a great question to ask, isn't it? What does it take to be a Christian? There are people in the world and there are people in churches who say, well, to be a Christian, you have to. Well, fill in the dots. You have to go to church every Sunday. Well, we can't do that during lockdown, can we? That's not been possible. So if I'm not going to, to church physically, I've been not a Christian. There are other people who say, well, to be a Christian, you have to be christened. Well, I wasn't christened. I was brought up in a family that didn't believe in christening. So does christening make me a Christian? And if I'm not Christ christened, does it mean I'm not a Christian? Uh, you have to go to mass or communion or confession. It's been difficult to share communion this last little while. Some churches are doing it in different ways. But how do we have communion? It's been very difficult. I've never been to confession. You see, there are Christians, people who say we're followers of Jesus, who have said, in order to be a Christian, you have to. You have to. And then there's a list. You have to keep the Ten Commandments. Well, there was a man who went to Jesus and he said, all of these I've kept since I was young. And he still turned his back on Jesus and walked, walked away, that rich young ruler. When Jesus said, give what you have to the poor, sell it and come and follow me. So what does it take to be a Christian? That's the question of Acts chapter 15. And there's a wonderful verse right in the heart of this passage and I, I, I hope you noticed it and it's this statement we should not make it difficult for those Gentiles who are coming to God it's right at the heart of what I want to say this morning I'm not going to take much longer we've kind of set the scene we've told you what the argument is about but they say we should not make it difficult for those who are coming to God. I believe that many of our churches have made it difficult for people who are coming to God. We made it difficult. You know, we've said to people, if you want to get to know Jesus, you need to come to our building because we're going to run a we're going to run a service uh, come to our building because we're going to do a course come to our building because we're going to run a club and people don't want to come to our building and now because of a worldwide pandemic we can't use our buildings <laughs> then we say to people well you need to come to the mission or you need to come to a service or when I was growing up, uh, although, um, you know, we, we said we welcome people whoever and however, there was a sort of pressure to dress a certain way. You felt if you didn't dress a certain way, you weren't going to fit in. So there are some spoken and some unspoken requirements not to become a Christian. I know you and I don't believe that there are any barriers to people coming to Christ other than to repent of their sins and put their trust in Jesus. But the argument, the discussion, the debate, the decision in Acts chapter 15 resolves this issue. 
you don't have to dress a certain way you don't have to be a particular color it doesn't matter if you're male or female it doesn't matter if you're Jew or Gentile it doesn't matter if you're slave or free it doesn't matter faith in Christ is all that matters they gave two or three little things uh, that they underlined and said it would be good if you are they don't say you have to but it would be good it would be good if you abstain from animals that are uh, offered to idols of course idolatry was a was a massive issue uh, in the in the world of their day and we have idols in our world too whether they're sports heroes or pop stars or uh, our television or our mobile phone or an app that we use or Facebook or our children we can make idols out of our family or a husband or a wife or you know abstain from the meat of animals offered to idols and um, avoid eating the, the the blood if you can in other words they were just saying if it's possible don't offend your Jewish brothers and sisters that's that's a good rule isn't it it's not even a rule it's not stopping you from coming to Jesus it's just do, do your best not to offend those who are struggling with the stuff that's no problem for you and then of course there's the the one other which is avoid sexual immorality now the Bible is very clear about sexual immorality and we need to live lives of purity but I don't do that to come to Jesus you know impure people and that's you and me we're welcome but when the Holy Spirit comes into my life he transforms me he makes me holy and I become or I'm becoming more like Jesus so purity is something that God calls me to so that's it in summing up I mean it was great we could learn a lot about how to resolve problems from this you know call a meeting listen to God's wisdom what's the Holy Spirit saying and I could have preached this message in that way but I really think the bottom line and the ultimate lesson for us all to learn is that we shouldn't make it difficult for those who are coming to God and maybe this season is a good season for us to reflect on how we can remove the barriers that may be appearing in people's minds or by our demeanor or actions or words that would stop people investigating and exploring the person of Jesus Christ Christ died for our sins Peter preaches earlier in the book of Acts there is no other name under heaven given amongst us whereby we must be saved so salvation alone is through Jesus and they ripped up the rule book and they said you don't have to do all this other stuff to be accepted by God and neither do you and neither do I it's all through Christ it's all grace and it's all through the finished work of Jesus on the cross praise God that Christ hung on a cross and he said it is finished may God help you and I to rest on what Jesus did to live in the joy of his resurrection to live in the fullness of his indwelling Holy Spirit and to put no barriers in the way of others so that they can come to Jesus Lord bless you it's been great to be with you and I hope that I'll be able to see you in the flesh sooner rather than later God bless take care bye bye Well, thank you so much for your time with us. Do comment on the email address or to the mobile phone that is listed. We'd love to be in touch with you. If you'd like help or support, or you'd like to know more about following Jesus, or you just have uh, burdens or needs that you would like someone to pray with you or for you about, please do send them to us on those personal means as listed on the screen. I'm going to pray that God's blessing will be with you. And after I pray, we will have our concluding song. Lord Jesus, thank you for speaking to us. Thank you that in the book of Acts, the uh, apostles, the church leaders in Jerusalem grappled with 
what was really important. And we know that the most important thing is preaching the gospel of Jesus, to become disciples of Jesus, to follow Jesus and to make others aware of his call on their lives and his offer to each of us. Lord, we pray that you would bless each person who has watched and tuned in and connected with us this Sunday. We pray that you would watch over us, that you would help us to keep the main thing the main thing, not to get too hung up or distracted or discouraged or depressed by other issues that may be in our lives. Help us to keep our eyes fixed on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. We pray this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. God bless you. Enjoy our closing song and I look forward to seeing you again soon. Take care. God bless. Bye-bye. How great the chasm that lay between us how high the mountain I could not climb In desperation I turned to heaven And spoke your name into the night Then through the darkness Your loving kindness Tore through the shadows of
Salvation